Oh my god, boys. We are officially dealing with a fucking Sam Scram. This week on the Squatchers Lounge Podcast, we're going to take a little detour from our scheduled programming and welcome the newest ape man and member of our own genus, Homo Naledi. There were several interesting anthropological finds this week, but this one is the biggest, folks, and interesting for Bigfooters for reasons that we'll discuss later. After the news and some words from our sponsors, etc. So it is without further ado, I give to you the host of our show, the Reverend Jeff Kelly. Look at that. Another day, another dollar, another week, another show, and we are officially 5,000 subscribers on YouTube. Thank you very much to everybody who actually watches the show, subscribes, and enjoys it. We do it for you guys because it sure isn't for the money. With me, as always, is Dr. David Backdorf, pseudo-scientist. How you doing, buddy? Uh, pretty good. We ended up with so many news links on this one that we just had to just sort of, uh, we'll, we'll go for the topic we were going to do uh, the following week and just going to ride ri- this uh anthropological uh madness into the ground hoo-ha is absolutely right we're gonna have a lot of fun tonight because this is gonna be cool stuff but first up as always and now for the squatchers lounge news bringing you the most up-to-date topics from across the interwebs week after week after week the squatchers lounge podcast Let's get newsy. That's right, but we're not getting to the professor quite yet, but we'll get there. All right, well, first up, up to our sponsor, Dr. Squatch Soap Company. That's right, step into the shower and escape to nature. I'm up on the uh, Irish Spring type stuff, the spearmint basil scrub. Holy crap, Ooh. Irish Spring can kiss my ass. Okay, this is just damn good stuff. You can get it at dot or you can look up Dr. Squatch on Facebook, and they are all over the place. Thank you, gentlemen, for sponsoring the podcast. All right, first up tonight, we're talking about how scientists use hidden camera traps to get incredible cameos of animals in the wild. Look at that little kid cat. So, so this is a really cool uh, kind of expose that this guy did on his setup. Um, it, it, he's working in South America using... using DSLR cameras. He probably should have a little bit more enclosure around him because one of his cameras actually gets like destroyed by termites and stuff like that. But a really cool, really simple setup that if you had a kick around camera, let's say, or or something that you could you know <laughs> enclose your camera within, um, that anybody could set up. It's not terribly intrusive. Um, has a trigger basically where where this animal is is standing um there there's an infrared trip line basically an infrared trigger that goes along the ground um and he's got two flashes in tupperware containers and he got nice even light and he's pre you know focused the camera on the spot where he's going to take that picture um and basically he's got this huge collection of these really amazing shots up close of these critters where he just left his camera out in the woods or in in, in the jungle technically uh for you know weeks to months at a time <laughs> so a really cool look at like get, definitely uh you know if, if if i had uh had the means or a little bit more gear could really put something like this together pretty easily that's just fantastic looking close-ups but it's definitely not from your regular old camera trap that is for sure. Hey, no. good news. The panda cub at the National Zoo is growing, weighs nearly two pounds. Dude, I have my entire life been keeping up with the pandas at the National Zoo. It used to be old Ling Ling and Sing Sing, and the little bastards wouldn't screw to save their species for the nothing of them. And when they would, they'd come out with some runtly little thing that would die on them a month later. So, you know, hallelujah, this thing's already up to two pounds and growing. But I don't think it's Ling Ling and Sing Sing anymore. I think they've done... They, they, yeah, it's not. It's Tin Tin and Yin Yin. They, they didn't mix them up because they just they wouldn't screw to save their species. That's the problem with the pandas. But uh, look at that little guy. I'm so cute. They're they're adorable. And the pandas, even in the wild, which is why they're having so much trouble um, dealing with you know the pressures that they're dealing with, is that their mortality rate is just so high um, because they're they're so hard to rear on the the nutrient poor diet that they have. Anyway, but they're adorable, and we'll we'll get, give this little guy the the go for it. Dude. That's right, man. <laughs> get bigger, become a big boy, breed for another year. Anyhow, just blame Bigfoot for the inability to bust illegal pot farmers safe. What? Yeah, so the Texas law enforcement get this tip from uh, some hog 
or some hog wranglers, I guess that they call them hog hunters, that there's a, a pot farm and a pot camp up in this Texas national forest area. So they get all their buddies together. The cops get all their, 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 their shenanigans in line and they go out there to, to, to rustle up these pot farmers. And sure enough, they come across these Bigfooters who are out there looking for Bigfoot just to stick in the friggin' program here. Um, I don't think the Bigfooters were really trying to stop them from finding the marijuana guys, but uh, apparently the Delta County Sheriff Rick Smith told reporters that the crop, which was estimated to have a value of around $6 million, was the largest discovery of marijuana found in his career. So they got the crop. They got all the plants. Woohoo! They can parade it around on television. It's going to be legal in another friggin' year or two anyhow. Woo! I'll get to let all them people out of jail anyhow. I don't know what you're trying to put them in jail for in the first place. Anyhow, uh, according to NPR, the illegal cultivation operation had been there since around May. The growers had it fully equipped camp site, complete with generators, watering systems, and camouflaging materials. That's how it gets done, folks. Thanks to High Times for that one. What do you think, man? Bigfooters <laughs> screwing up the pot farms? I'm pretty sure that the Bigfooters were just a part of the story alongside. They, I don't think they were actually impeding anybody's, you know, ability to 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 bust what they actually busted. So <laughs> I guess the question though is, you know, is Bigfoot eating pot and getting hallucinations on the highs? Maybe that's where those orbs are coming from. Who knows? Anyhow, <laughs> apes do the darndest things. That's right. Chimps displaying hunting foraging skills that may have served early hominids just as well. That's kind of creepy, dude, to think that these things are evolving to the Stone Age and they're going to start hunting us, I think, before too long. The chimps are pissed, man. They're just pissed at the humans. What's well, going so, on so, here, brother? Yeah, yeah. Here, here, here's the here's the thing is, is basically we're just giving the Stone Age back to the chimps. They're not evolving into the Stone Age. It's like, oh, wait, well, the more we look at them, the more they're doing all these things already. Okay, I got it. I get it. I get it. I get it. Um, you know, they, they probably were doing that the entire time, which actually makes you have to look at the different types of tool use that we're talking about um and uh you know when we refer to the stone age we're not refer we're re referring to actual crafting of stone into tools uh, so to say that the chimps are crafting tools maybe they're into the wood and stick age but uh, our, yeah. but our you know um our common asked ancestor may have been in the wood and stick age when, when we left that together so that, that that's a very interesting question actually you know so if chimpanzees can still do this and they didn't need to evolve their tool making abilities and then we did that would make total sense that they would still have this very primitive um thing and so it's not that they're doing the darndest things or that they're they're learning or it's going to be some sort of like planet of the apes uprising anytime soon it just means that we we're probably both doing the same damn thing Six million years ago, and then they just stuck with it where we thought it wasn't good enough. <laughs> All right on. Well, that's how the apes do the darndest things. Twelve theories of how we became human and why they're all wrong. Thanks to National Geographic for telling us all of our theories are wrong. Mark Strauss of National Geographic tells us, well, we make tools. And since this is the whole thing we were just talking about. Talk, oh, tell yeah, me about I, I was going to say, we, we've, we've, uh, yeah, as you scroll down, we've talked about all this stuff. You know, we're not the only species that makes tools. However, a bilateral hand axe in, in the Acheulean tools of homo erectus that's very much something special that the chimpanzees cannot do we're killers well uh, we've talked about the killer chimpanzees and how they're wiping out entire you know species and then they're they're gonna hold up you know uh, like uh, probably a uh, afarensis australopithecus scene yeah afarensis uh child there and um talking about how they were killers and killed each other and you can see the fractured skull line okay uh we're the only ones who share food and okay so we've learn that there's a lot of this food sharing and maybe they're talking about uh, is it the Dimonisi specimen where they fed the man who had no teeth okay um you know we swim in the nude well we know that there's lots of aquatic apes all of a sudden that are swimming all around maybe not <laughs> apes that maybe uh, other simians but i saw know. an orangutan in a damn canoe the other day okay just <laughs> with a baby under his arm just like using his hands for paddles it was just going down some damn creek in orangutan country because it's all some human do it yeah fantastic stuff anyhow we throw stuff yeah, so we throw stuff well a lot of other <laughs> things throw stuff and we've oh, actually we had a monkey um, that threw poop yeah <laughs> um so so the the fact that uh it, the, 
you know, we've actually seen um, chimpanzees actually hunting with with stones, at least to stun animals and other things like that. Okay, so yeah, we're, we're not the only, you know, this is not part of our uh, evolution. Um, we hunt well. We've seen organized chimpanzee hunts. We finally filmed that a few years ago. Okay, we, we trade, trade food, food for, for sex. Sex. Now, mm, I wish. <laughs> hey, maybe I got a double. I got a double double animal style going on over yeah, here. Yeah, who 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 doesn't? Anyway, no. So basically, it's you know talking about how we. Um, used to carry food around to to trade for uh for mating and that's why we've been no no this is, these are just kind of you know other theories uh well we, we they hang out with us because we got the meat that's the way it's always worked the more meat you got the more chicks are on your ass anyhow sorry okay, we so cooked meat we cooked meat and that's why our you know our big hungry brains and that's why we got all okay so the, i can if, if we, just, we just keep going down this just really ties it all together um yeah uh and uh, uh so you know we 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 adapt okay everything adapts that's why it's still here there's things that aren't adapting fast we enough we unite that's and different. conquer we unite and conquer well I love again, we divide and conquer I yeah, yeah maybe, maybe 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 that's that's the same too uh and uh you know at so basically why all of these theories are wrong is not exactly why a national geographic is saying them in this article they're talking about the the individual fallacies of it it's because it was no one of any of these things that led to uh, our evolution it was all of these things right in concert that allowed us to get to where we are today there's no one you know a stone wasn't anything our brains didn't grow because we ate meat we you know or cooked meat uh you know it, our brains grew so that we figured out how to make you know make the best of the situation or understood that that's you know, makes us feel better or somehow well, maybe we're going to, yeah, euphoric. we're going to talk about that cooked meat too here in just a little bit about how old that might just be. Yeah. And, and so, so th those are, those are sort of like, you know, th th those are like precursors. Like did the, did the meat grow the brain or did the brain grow and need the meat? Th those are the sort of questions that you can't really answer, but it doesn't matter. It's part of the overall cons concerto of effects that made us human not any one of these things exactly and there we go check it out at nationalgeographic.com yeah they're all <laughs> wrong because they support themselves and not the whole picture <laughs> that's right shifting human ancestors diet earlier than previously thought key to move to grass-based food was four hundred thousand years earlier than previously known johns hopkins university studying the old teeth and old fossils of these ape people and, and old hominids and, and homo sapien and erectus and all these other people. They got 152 tooth fragments in Ethiopia uh, in an isotope analysis to find evidence of the diet change itself. Yeah, I mean, they, they can look at a lot of things. They can look at the wear on the teeth and they can look at the actual isotopes to see what's still on the teeth because there there there's trace elements of all sorts of things. And, you know, of course, there's the, the background stuff that you would expect to see on there. But then there would be like grass or something like that so it, that easy to look for those isotopes when you know what to look for because and that also really goes to the point of when we've moved from hunter gatherers to you know to agriculture you know or um you know this is even looking um like when we shifted our diets from you know being kind of fruit and insect eating you know, apes like like the chimpanzees still are <laughs> um, to this more um, planes oriented sort of a thing. Now, what what this is what this is uh, said. I, I believe that it's um, taking it back. To, I, I just had this up. Um, it, it's taking it back to a to a to an area where it's it's kind of in that gray gray area where we don't have a good. Uh, if, if you scroll down just a little bit, two point six million to five point three right. million years ago. So, so so in this particular area, they're actually the able to data area, to right. about three point eight million years ago, which is prior to to Homo, which is exactly what you want to see. So what this is basically what it's doing is it's showing, and, and the way that they they word the article is like. Uh, the, earlier than previously thought no it's earlier than previously known this is now the oldest in this geographical area because we're going to get to this too about how africa is a pretty big place right. um, and in this geographical area um which has very old 
you know, versions of, of, uh, of this kind of plan's existence, um, how 400,000 years is a big deal because that takes it completely, you know, like, like it kind of, it separates gr from one, one gray area into another gray area. So you're like right in the middle you're like, wow, I wish I had the rest of this skeleton. <laughs> right. yeah. Like that would be the most amazing thing ever. And we might get into that later too. Right. And in the desert, you never know what you're going to find. All right. Mm -hmm. Next up, a, a book review by Lauren Coleman on the isu.edu website of Dr. Sykes's Nature of the Beast, the first genetic evidence of the survival of Ape Man, Yeti, Bigfoot, and other mysterious creatures into modern times. You know, that the name of this book just keeps changing. It's changed about seven different times now before release. But uh, yeah, sure, whatever. Um, I didn't read it. Uh, I, I'm sorry. I, I honestly did not read the book review by Lauren. I talked to Lauren about it, uh, or messaged Lauren about it, asked him some questions about it uh, when he first actually did the book review uh, a, a couple of months back. And I asked about his thoughts on the whole Lori Simmons, Adam Davies uh, uh, encounters that he had in Washington. And what I was told was that Dr. Sykes felt as though they were personal experiences and wishful thinking, nothing more. However, if you read this book review, it should be in there somewhere for yourself. I'm just not going to read all that. Sorry, not interested. I'm not interested in giving Dr. Sykes any money on this book at all. I mean, it really is a farce compared to what he's trying to do with the title. Um, he's trying to make himself relevant, relevant into the Bigfoot world with this book, but I don't really know what this book has unless it's about Xana. Uh, is that what he's getting the title from? I mean, we know that she was sub-Saharan African. Now they're saying, now they're trying to pull some archaic, ancient African Saharan DNA out of her. I, I don't really know what's going on with this. David, did you, did, did you get a grip? I, I, did, I didn't really... Well, there you have it. Uh, I, I did. I, 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 you yeah. did edu website. Move it on. Go check it out. Yeah, it, it, the, the, the the whole the whole the whole thing is is interesting that he wrote a book about it, and I think it's probably more to do with the 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 hopeful and wishful thinking um, of uh, Bigfooters, uh, and and probably less to do with. Uh, any evidence of any of the actual of the modern evidence time. aside from hey, everything that we tested came out. Like it came out. <laughs> right. Exactly. All right. Now, filing, finishing up the news tonight, we've got close calls three times when humanity barely escaped extinction. That's right. We almost didn't become Homo sapiens because the world was almost gone. Holy crap. However, as we have said several times on the podcast before, it's those evolutionary bottlenecks that help to speciate. Like, you know, we'd, if, if, if it weren't for, you know, when they're talking about these times when we got down to as little as like 10,000, or in some cases, they think it could be as little as 600 people. Although this particular article um, mentions that, that, uh, you know, at 1.2 million years, I think they're talking about, uh, uh, they say, you know, Homo erectus and, and uh, you know, Australopithecus and, and uh, a bunch of things that don't make sense as far as, and, and Homo sapiens, which was not a thing at all. Like they tie that in just so they know that it's a line that's sort of like, like it, it's, it's moving towards us somehow, I guess. Um, but uh, yeah, so again, be careful what you read into that because uh, there were no Homo sapiens 1.2 million years ago. Um, but there were, in this third extinction, uh, you know, or near extinction, um, you know, so there's 1.2 million years. We go down we're like 150,000 years ago. Okay, well, we have split from um, Neanderthal at that point, um, but we're like Homo antecessor, like we're not actually where. So prior to this 70,000 years ago, we're saying we're modern Homo sapiens, sapiens, and ta da, here's our last extinction. Why we get all this genetic material that points to one particular area for our expansion out of Africa as genetically. Um, and this is... Little uh, down to between 1,000 and 10,000 people, and yet here we are at nearly, what, 7 billion now? Yep, and it was a... Uh, um, basically, it was, it was a super volcano um, that kind of just wiped out everything <laughs> um, <laughs> everything yeah the, i mean the the toba explosion was was a huge deal um 
so, yeah, so or, or was it that, that wasn't a meteor? Yeah. Meteor, it was no, a that no, was a total explosion. It yeah, was, yeah, uh, and re- volcanic eruption, um, mm-hmm. catastrophes like earthquake, blah blah blah. blah. I, so, I th- this was a global event, like dark in the skies, crazy event that we we've never seen, um, since, um, and almost wiped us out. Uh, and and so what they're saying is this is why we have that uh, the. The genetic history that we have, you know, beginning um, prior to this, because everybody who was here was still was genetically linked to to a, a group of people. Very interesting. Um, in- but anyway, indeed. All right. Well, let's wrap up the news with our other sponsor, Treasured Metal Jewelry. Dot com. That's right. They're the ones sponsoring the Silver Bullet contest. Go out to treasuredmetaljewelry.com. Click on the Silver Bullet contest button. Contest is running. Started the 26th. is going to end September 29th at 11 p.m. Eastern time. All winners will be now announced on the Squatchers Lounge podcast on the September 30th show. Please follow the directions below to enter the contest. That's right. Just put your name in there. Put your email address in there. Under subject, just put in enter me and enter the message. Tell them Reverend Jeff sent you. Click submit and you're entered. That's right. We're going to pull <laughs> the lucky names. We got one two ounce winner, one one ounce silver winner, and three solid copper winners. That's right. They're going to be bullet replicas. They are really cool. They make a great pendant. Uh, I talked to Joseph this week. And he had mentioned that they've got some new pieces in uh, the wolf tooth. The wolf tooth uh, is up on the website. Uh, Solid silver skull is now available. A peace sign in in the in the leaf. Yeah, they're up there as well. He's got all kind of neat pieces up there for sale. There's a nice cross online there. Kitty cat. He'll do some special order stuff for you as well. He'll mount. There's one of the there's one of the copper pieces mounted up. Boy, that looks really really nice. Uh, I mount up some some. Uh, custom coin jewelry that really really looks good uh they're they're just they can make incredible pieces so check them out at treasuredmetaljewelry.com okay guess what time it is it's time for our tip of the week as soon as i can get up the screen here and get back over here and get this off my screen i have to bring up the picture because well it's just that important so we'll talk to you in just a minute after our tip of the week Oh, God, where did I put it? I had to move everything around. <laughs> I did. I moved everything around, and I have no clue where I put it, so I'll just put another copy of it up, and here we go. And now it's time for Rules to Squatch By with your old pal, Wes. Number 46. Be more like the great adventurer Kip Pretty Pants Moral. Take more selfies. You never know what might be lurking behind you. And if anyone's going to get anything... It's going to be Kip. He takes a hell of a lot of selfies. Come check out my recent work and my art for sale at westlosner.com. Stay squatching, my friends. That's right. Now, that'll probably be the last one of our tip of the week's uh, rules to squash by with your old pal, Wes. Not because he's going anywhere, but because we've turned it into a whole new bit. And now, Seeking Enlightenment with your old pal, Wes. Brought to you by westlosner.com. That's oh, right. Join us here. <laughs> yeah, join us next Wednesday for Seeking Enlightenment with your old pal, Wes. Thanks a lot. Check it out at weslosner.com. Okay, Davey, guess what, buddy? It is absolutely that time for the topic of the week. And now for tonight's topic. That's right. We got all kind of craziness going on here, people. I got this thing that came across my desktop. I said, oh, now that's something new. And I think this is going to be quite interesting. So why don't we go take a look at this? Um, six tiny cavers, 15 odd skeletons, one amazing new species of ancient human. Now, we're just hearing about this for the first time. Why? Because this was real science. Scientists found it. They studied it. They found out a shitload about it. And then they released the findings to the public. That's how real science is done. Hey, eh, David? Yeah, I, I mean like everything else like anthropology it like the anthropological sciences are pretty much as ruthless as the bigfooters i mean there there's a, a bunch of people and i'll get into this in a little bit they're like well not so fast well they're not saying that they didn't find a bunch of bones and they're not saying that this isn't a really important discovery 
what they're saying is, well, you haven't got an appropriate data out of the bones and yada, yada, yada. But let's just think for a moment that the the science that they, that what they have been able to get, because I mean, this, this sort of stuff takes time and, and yeah, you get excited and you might, you might make some leaps and you might say some things to some reporters and then that's what they put on national geographic versus, <laughs> or, or, um, versus what you actually put in your paper, etc. So what, what we are seeing is a very interesting mosaic of, homo traits like of of like well you like, know we we do have that piece to play let's let's play that professor piece uh, he does, he does very, piece. very good job of explaining what they're trying to convey and i yeah can he's gonna give us a, a good yeah. introduction to it so let's yeah. take a listen to professor lee berger introduce homo nilea yeah i'm professor Nalea. lee berger i'm a research professor in the evolutionary studies institute at university of the waters Ram, an explorer in residence at national geographic and I'm here to introduce to you a new species of early human ancestor called Homo naledi. Homo naledi was discovered in 2013 by teams here in the rising star system in a chamber that we've named the Dinaledi Chamber, or Chamber of Stars. It is the most significant and extensive discovery of early human relatives of fossils ever made on the continent of Africa more than 1,550 remains, representing more than 15 individuals from infants to babies to toddlers to tweens, teenagers, young adults, adults, and, and elderly. Uh, the species is remarkable. It's got a tiny brain, uh, barely larger than an orange, with small teeth, but that are primitive in shape, staying across a relatively tall body, maybe a meter and a half tall, in the males at least, females about 1.4, 1.45 meters, skinny, with human-like arms, but a ape-like thorax and chest with a very primitive pelvis. The hands are a mix between very, very advanced human-like hands, but the fingers are, are curved, like very, very primitive ancient human ancestors. From mid-thigh down, it looks like a human. Long legs, human-like feet. Really a combination that we've never seen before in the fossil record. And I suppose most surprising is what they were doing in this chamber. Um, my colleagues and I from around the world have studied these fossils for more than two years, studied their context, and we've come to the conclusion that this species of non-human hominid was deliberately disposing of its dead, taking the dangerous journey into this deep chamber to place its dead or drop its dead into a place inaccessible uh, by any other. Something that prior to this, we thought was unique to humans and in fact, maybe identified us. Now it doesn't. Well, there you have it. I think it's a fantastic way to actually introduce this new tiny little species, this little three, three and a half foot tall monkey person I guess, eight man, uh, for lack of a better term, to 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 our, our viewers. Now, David, what what are you getting out of all of this? So, so what I see, like, size is is is, is very much similar to the the Australopithecine um, of the time and of prior, like the Afarensis that we were used to seeing. Um, more in the so so there's two cradles of humanity and this is in the uh, the southern one the South African cr cradle of humanity uh, versus like the that that Ethiopian like East African cradle of humanity so um, what what this really shows us is is that kind of morph morphing not you know morphologically like wh where you see from from Afarensis into Erectus and that early, you know, like not even erectus, but into habilis, but that's happening at a different time. So this is really showing us how wide um, and, and like and widespread this 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 actually was. And the, some of the dates that they're coming to this spe these specimen are, are, are from like in, in the three million year old range, which really predates a lot of the other uh you know human ancestors um and if you want to say that those were the discoveries of um you know like the the, the habilis and ergaster coming from that ethiopian area um this is something that's that's uh you know radiating through africa um the interesting thing is that there's some 
similarities between these guys and some of the morphological features, at least in the skulls and 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 the primitive features that we see in the Dimenisi specimen, which you would expect, you know, the more primitive radiating um, as you radiate out from, let's say, our our. Uh, gene pool center, um, if you will, like you would expect to see older and older looking variants as you go out because there's less diversity to 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 go through. So it's really interesting that this is, is kind of showing us everything that you would expect if you were to find something at this age, at this time, everything that you would hope to find to kind of confirm, yes, this is exactly what we would expect to see. So uh, this was a climber. It had a rib cage for climbing trees. It was probably, um, you know, they, they were definitely spending more time in trees than any of our other ancestors that we've ever known about in the Homo genus. And the reason we're putting them in the Homo genus is there's two reasons. One is because they appear to have a fused toe almost indistinguishable from Homo erectus. Um, and two, because to navigate these corridors in this cave even millions of years ago, you know, looking at where collapses may have happened, this may have happened, that may have happened. There's probably some pinch points that, that these cavers had to deal with that, you know, the ancestors didn't. Um, but to get as far back as they, I mean, they, they were, I think it was like six or 700 meters back in this cave, would have had to have had a light source. Yeah, it said almost immediately the team hit several narrow pitch black corridors. A knife edged ridge called the Dragon's Back with steep drops on either side, and finally a 12 meter chute. It's a long crack punctuated by shark teeth protrusions. Yeah. <laughs> I remember looking down thinking, I'm not sure if I made the right decision. Yeah. It's like, why? Yeah. <laughs> why, oh, why did I you choose to go through all of that? Then at the bottom, they ease down to the area they call the landing zone before entering the fossil filled trove that they call the 101 chamber. On the first day, they excavated a single bone, a mandible. It came out and we said, wait a minute. This isn't what we thought. You know, stop everything. <laughs> This this is this is human or the, in the in the human line. This is an ape. How about that? Um, because they would uh, their, uh, their teeth would not have looked you know human. They would have wouldn't have looked erectus. They would have been more like that ergaster. And if you look or, or and and I think and, they have. yeah well, here they are. Here. Um, you know. Without that, that the the big you know foliage breaking incisors, you know, like the 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 canines that that the you know our our monkey friends have you know like these these teeth are big and they're they're not like ours let's just put it that way um so looking at them you would have been really confused as to what you were seeing until you realized that they didn't have those those big you know foliage breakers in the front and you're like wow this is it's pretty pretty intense i mean um, what did they think they found a bunch of underground dwelling freaking chimpanzees Chuds, chuds. Uh, <laughs> That's right. <laughs> uh, no, so so basically, yeah. The, the 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 most interesting thing is how did they get all the way back into this cave without killing themselves like five times over if they didn't have a light source? Even I, I we'll just say it this way: even a thousand years ago <laughs> well, i mean we're, we're 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 like you know sailing the seven seas at this point but we still don't have a light bulb right how did we get in there oh wait if this is really truly three million years ago the only thing that we could have had is fire now that pushes that that uh, you know they're, they're not you know in that soundbite he didn't make that claim but apparently elsewhere and that's where people are like wait just one minute however this cave is very near one of the oldest sites where they have the best evidence. You know, there's other sites that people are, you know, there's contention, you know, contention between things. This is like the, the oldest known non argued site where there is fire um, is within, let's just say like it's within a quarter mile of this spot. And that's pretty amazing. Yeah. And, and if they can link the two of them, like I said, we were talking pre-show, you know, if they were using fire in there, fire leaves carbon residue on the ceilings and on the walls. That never goes away until it's scraped off. So the, over the thousands and millions of years that have gone by, limescale would form. We've talked about the water drippings and everything else. 
it would still be there, but they're going to have to excavate that cave to be able to figure that stuff out. Now, let's see here. Deep in the dark zone. Deep in the dark zone. So, well, this is an, an interesting. You know, when you're talking about this, you know, the, the, the two different cradles of humanity, if you will. One is this South African area where, um, you know, the, where we're, we're, we're basically saying that modern Homo sapiens was relegated to this little area and along the coastlines there were a couple populations um that made it and they were mostly eating you know sea uh, sea, sea life uh, a lot of uh clams and, and other things and using tools and, and and so a very important area this here uh, is is an interesting uh interesting find um but this is where we've kind of historically thought of the cradle of humanity as being this is where erectus or gaster and all these other guys come out of with all of their tools that seem to spread all across you know from here and radiate out over over the earth so what we have to do is remember that we're separating by millions of years the radiation out of this cradle of humanity and coming back down to where we had a mass extinction of basically what would be the, the the human race and this is where we were left at the end so the, the, there's important parts of both of these um but the, we have to, you have to the the two things have to be completely separated by two million years <laughs> let's just be clear about that uh, but yeah so so this is an important area and this is an important area but the interesting thing is that where we're focused on this area for our you know at the, the afarensis and um and you know or, early, uh, you know, like transition into Habilis and Ergaster and Erectus and all those other other guys here, that this was going on prior to that. And then way up here <laughs> somewhere, um, we were also having those uh, Diminisi guys, which means that there was a, uh, uh, we really did cover a lot more of the earth um, back before we're finding fossils but okay so here's here's our cave this is what these people came through and this you know like less than Superman's 10 inches high, that was Superman probably crawl. a cave in yeah so the, the, these things you know the fact that you can get through there's probably a good uh you know a, a tube that you can crawl through that was falling down and some of these things but still when you're back this if anybody's ever gone caving you go back around that first corner or you go back down here and there's no light yeah, light like, does not bend. Yeah, it, it it goes in one direction, and whether there was, you know, like at the top, maybe, the, at the very top entrance where they see the little white guy standing there, the yep, light yep. would come penetrating directly down through that hole, and it would go against the other side of the wall, and it would it, stop. Yeah, and it would just diffuse. And once you, but right. they're fine. The fossil site is back in this other chamber, um, and 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 yes, things change and things move a lot, and and we 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 all understand that. Um, but what doesn't happen is that an entire fossil site doesn't come from back here and move back here. Right now, the, I mean, imagine if you will that these people were cave people and they were living back here this is one of the other kind of debunker theories that i heard that wasn't the scientific version but somebody on on uh just uh in in comments because you know the idiocy that happens there anyway we're, we're talking about how well what if they were just living in there and they all got caved in and there was 15 people who died at the same time well no that's that seems logical however if they were living back here in complete darkness with 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 no fire well, well what if they had fire and they well, they would have suffocated right because the the fire would have consumed all of the air back here and and you know and they they end it here but this goes on by the way and that you know you you start to run into deadly gases and all the bad stuff that you end up you know what what spelunkers have to be careful of and they have gear to make sure that you know as gas bubbles up yeah so there's no reason for a three million, a two million, a one million year old ancestor to be this deep back into a cave, unless they were either hiding a body, um, or yeah, and that's even far fetched, honestly, for me. Um, uh, but uh, th there has to be a really good reason to get back in there. Um, and one of the reasons that they don't basically bring up that I am, I, you know, I could think of for myself 
is actually disease. You know, say somebody got the flu and they just forced them back into this cave. <laughs> you are and, not jabbing them with a stick back there, punk. All the way. Come on now. You're, so, you're sick. You know, like, you know, no, no, go ahead. Just crawl on through. <laughs> Don't worry. We'll come get you when you're better. Yeah. You're America's problem now. Um, <laughs> no, but so, so um, th this is, uh, I don't know, like a, a, a really, uh, interesting situation and we don't really understand it and some people have made some very bold postulations that are based on a lot of things that they've seen and that we haven't and people can poo-poo on it and that's fine but um this is a a, a really interesting interesting find and there's a lot of people that have been critical of it so i, I just thought i'd bring some of that stuff up <sighs> for sure my man i mean dude it's like every time there's a new hominid found Everybody, well, it's not, you know, that doesn't prove anything. Well, this thing has feet just like ours. That actually kind of means a lot. It's one of the things that we've been looking for is to find another upright walking bipedal species like ourselves that, you know, actually would have a remnants leftover population at some point to become the Sasquatch. All right. David's got the All world right. up for us here. He's going to show us what's going on. <laughs> I've got the whole world in my hands. Got the so, whole world. On so, so I, again, you know, I pointed out the, the sort of geographical area here and I where we're kind of looking down here. So what I'd want to point out before I kind of go into like the, the next sort of thing and talking about a couple of human ancestors just really quickly. I'm going to just go, go through this really quickly, I swear, um, is the amazing distances that we're talking about and when we're talking about the short amount of time that it took, you know, the, you know, 70,000 years, 60,000 years to populate the entire globe um, from a point down here from our, our, our meager 1,000 to 10,000 member species, right? <laughs> um, and you think about millions of years, millions and billions of years, um, you know, go Carl Sagan for a moment. Here is where we're talking about a lot of these tools radiating from after what we're talking about down here but prior to those tools showing up here we have these you know somewhat contemporary looking guys down here and then a little you know they're they're later we talk about gene flow we talk about evolution we talk about parallel of evolution and 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 even just the way that everybody's kind of going in the same direction um but in different geographical directions what you have to think about is south africa to south e ethiopia i mean you could fit like two americas in here right, right? you're two, talking two, two two usas right we're um, talking six thousand miles you um this this continent of africa you can fit most of the other land mass known land mass from from the earth in this so so this is a very much you know like a mis misconstrued thing however and you look at you know okay so the ocean lines are different or whatever but but this the himalayas that created this drying here this is something that's very important but at 1.8 million years ago and we brought this up several times, those Dimenisi Homo erectus that actually have some similar traits to these guys way down here, we find them way up here in Georgia. That's incredible to me. Um, yeah. That 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 if if you're thinking okay in a in 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 a you know five to seven hundred thousand years, you've got early looking hominid here contemporary guy here early looking hominid here if you think about radiating it out and the actual amount of gene pool that you have to, to to deal with and how evolution works that makes an amazing amount of sense to me and i i just like to bring that up here however it does leave those possibilities and i i like you know um these guys and, and as far as we know how um how things have moved, um, you know, and these could have been like, well, down here for sure, these could have been hairy apes. Up here, we found some examples, but how long had they been up here? 
these could have been hairy apes, um, you know, that just happen to walk upright and have feet just like ours and, and but don't look like us at all. Very interesting um, for that Sasquatch question for sure. And those are the sorts of questions that I want more answers to. I need timelines, damn it. That's right. And it's going to take another five years before we get any of those answers. Any of those answers. That's but, right. Uh, yeah, that that's... <laughs> this is definitely a candidate for a full genome, though. This is something they're going to use that next-gen stuff that Crazy Ketchum was talking about using on the Bigfoot stuff. More nopes than a bag full of nopes. <laughs> nopes. <laughs> um, that's, it's, it's too old. Um, and, uh, you know... Oh, we, so it's we, basically we, rock at this point. Yeah, there, there, there's, there. You know, you can get the isotopes from, from data off of teeth, maybe ish, <laughs> um, depending on how it was preserved. Um, that would be interesting for sure, um, and and might actually, you know, I do, that there could be carbon. You know, we we there there's some data saying that uh, um, some of our early ancestors may, may have eaten uh, charcoal. Um, for supplement, um, you know, and they can they can see that like, well, they actually must have had fire if they were eating charcoal. <laughs> well, yeah, if they were eating well, or they were discovering, you know, charred plants after wildfires, or yeah, but yes, yeah, so, so of course, there's always that the the skeptical mind, but like um, that, but that's what science is there for, right? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, right. It's, well, it's, charcoal it's, also purifies water. That would be a way that you'd have charcoal introduced into the system. So, yeah. but charcoal would still require fire for that. If you're purifying well, yeah, water, yeah. then if you, you drink dirty water, you chew up some charcoal and try to purify it in your stomach. It might work. You never know. <laughs> 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 uh, but no, so 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 there there, there there's a lot of um a lot of really interesting uh you know mm. interesting stuff that's coming out of this, and uh, it, it's showing the bushiness of the hominin family tree. Um, and it's basically it, it. The more information that they're going to get from this, and the more that they can date it, and the more that they can do comparative studies. And I would love to see somebody do a study like from South Africa, Ethiopia, and say they're they're from a similar enough time, like within like you know a, a few hundred thousand years of each other, and do a comparative study between the Dimanisi peoples people the fossils from the same time in Ethiopia etc that would be a fantastic comparative study and would probably teach, teach us a lot about how evolution works um, uh, just in general amazing stuff I want, a, I want a time traveler machine I want to be able to go to the future and see how this shit all worked out anyhow yeah. folks that's actually going to do it for this edition of the Squatchers Lounge podcast I hope you guys have an idea of where it fits I like it I like the thing it shows that there are other species out there with human like legs that walk upright just like I've always said we're going to find more and more species as the as the spider web evolution as I call it is going to move out from there you know the family bush because it's not a tree it's definitely friggin bushes and little bastards that spread out <laughs> everywhere that's what the and and the, and the, the the more we we can find them to geographical areas where we f where we have found bones um which is the appropriate thing to do because you can't say that they're up there when you haven't seen them up there or down here or over there like so when we continue to look and continue to scratch the surface and we continue to have these finds um we will continue to kind of shape our idea of how our ancestors moved and hopefully someday that leads back to Sam Squanch. Sam Squanch. That's right, everybody. Well, that's going to do it for the Dr. David Batdorf, pseudoscientist. I am your host, the Reverend Jeff Kelly. And we say thanks for watching and may, whoops, that's not the picture I wanted to put up there. Um, God, <laughs> I am just all thumbs tonight. Thanks for watching and may the Squatch be with you. Look at that. I even found the theme. That's a handsome chap, by the way. Oh, dude, yeah. The guy, the guy who does those reconstructions, is, total stud. He is a a monster. He's really. Good. Next week, join us. I think we're going to talk about something in Patagonia. All kind of strangest going on in the Bigfoot world these days. Travis, not what you're going to find here. That's for damn sure. Nope. The bucket's still got plenty of room, people. Hey, go 
freaking sign up for the Silver Bullet Contest. TreasuredMetalJewelry.com. I want to see a whole bunch of entries tomorrow. I mean it. Please. There are many hospitals in Britain today devoted to the care and cure of crippled children, but one of the first to be funded, and still one of the most important, is the Lord Mayor Trelawa Cripples Hospital and College. Between four to five hundred children come here every year from Britain and overseas. Crippled boys and girls likely to benefit from treatment are admitted up to the age of 16. Most of them are children crippled by diseases acquired in childhood or suffering from deformities at birth. Here is a child brought to Trelawas to find health and strength. On their admission, they go to an observation ward for a period of quarantine. Two of the doctors have made their examination of little Maureen she doesn't seem to have found it very alarming. The doctors are followed by the head teacher, for while this may be a hospital, it is a school too, and during their stay, the children go on with their schoolwork in the usual terms. Their education is unbroken in spite of a spell in hospital. The X-ray room is a link between the remedial and the surgical departments. The X-ray photographs reveal the effects and extent of the disease invisible to the human eye. The X-ray has shown the need for an operation, and the honorary surgeon examines the plate while sisters and nurses prepare the theatre. The theatre has full modern equipment. The operating table has been specially designed for children's needs and can be adjusted to any required position. Lighting is by a single lamp which casts no shadows under the surgeon's hand. This air conditioning plant gives the best aseptic conditions. Vitally important in all operating theatres is the sterilising equipment. This is one of the recessed type. Over 600 operations of 50 different types were successfully carried out here last year. After an operation, the patient goes to a special recovery ward. Another important department is the plaster room for many of the patient's limbs must be supported both while they are still in bed and later when they're well enough to get up. Here, Sir Henry Gavain, the medical superintendent, is making a plaster cast for a child's hip. The bandages are prepared by spreading plaster of Paris on muslin strips dipped in water before being applied, after which they harden almost at once. Sir Henry Gavain has been the medical superintendent since the hospital was founded by the late Sir William Trelaw in 1908 and the impressive number of cures that have been effected since that date is due in a great measure to his untiring devotion to the children under his care. When the bandages have hardened, the cast is cut off and a model made from it. This is fined down until it is quite smooth. And then it is covered by coats of muslin and painted with a solution of celluloid in acetone. The model is now ready for the splint to be made. The splint is made in the hospital's own orthopedic workshop managed by an old college boy. Over 4,000 surgical appliances needed by the hospital have been supplied by this workshop. Trelawes has its own iron lung or drinker apparatus. This instrument is vital for the treatment of children whose respiratory organs have been impaired by infantile paralysis and a special staff trained in its correct use is always available day or night. On being sealed inside the lung, the patient is made to breathe by a regular alteration of air pressure. 
the air presses on the patient's diaphragm and thus brings about an involuntary emptying and filling of the lungs. The inspection plot shows how the machine itself breathes for the patient. In this light department, science plays a different but equally important part. Here, artificial rays of various types are used to combat skin diseases and other ailments. Finson arc combats some types of disease Tungsten arc, others, particularly tubercular glands. The radiant heat channel turns up paralyzed muscles. Does he feel toned up? Today, Maureen, convalescent from her operation, is being brought out onto the terrace for the first time. The hospital is designed so that natural sunlight can be used to the fullest advantage. Beds are taken out on the great terrace fronting the wards, and there the children can sleep, play, and eat. Another important branch of the hospital's work is carried on in this treatment center. After months or perhaps years in bed, rehabilitation is necessary. The children are brought up from the wards in electric trolleys and taken into this exercise room. Muscles must be strengthened and children taught to use their limbs again, even how to walk. Most of these exercises are done to music. This is an exercise for muscle coordination. And this for correcting a spinal deformity. This machine helps the cripple's first attempts to walk. And these exercises strengthen backs and legs. Massage is given by sisters and nurses with special training in this type of therapy. The hospital vamp is privileged to take her donkey anywhere, even into the pool room. The exercise pool is used for children whose limbs are too paralyzed to be moved against the bedclothes. Warm water supports the limbs and the child is encouraged to make the first small movements which in time will be increased. This form of treatment is naturally very popular with the children. The children spend a large part of their lesson time in the open air. Primary and secondary school education are both given. The children are grouped in wards as far as possible according to their standard and ability so that a ward becomes a class. At the same time, tuition is given to each child individually and each child is encouraged to get on by itself. Thus, the pace of the class need not be that of its slowest member. For the under fives, there are special toys. They're learning to work things out for themselves. For those more nearly cured, lessons are right out of doors whenever possible. The cripple's tendency to feel that they are cut off from ordinary life is counterbalanced by their opportunity of mental development and the companionship of Trelawes prevents the patient from becoming lonely. This youngster has spent nearly four years in hospital. He's cured now and will be going home soon. And when he gets home, everything will be done to see that the cure is permanent. School medical service officials keep a kindly eye on every child discharged from Trelawes or from any other of the hospitals for crippled children. Allied to Trelawes is the training school and college. Here, cripple boys may learn a trade. In this tailoring shop, they are taught by an expert and many first-class workmen have been turned out. Some of the boys now own their own businesses. Only their early training here has made that possible. In this shop, the boys are taught boot making and repairing. As with the tailoring shop, the hospital is the chief customer. Here, they do all the repairs and make all the surgical footwear for the hospital and for 14 other orthopedic clinics in Hampshire and the Isle of Wight. Trelawes is the largest hospital school of its kind in the British Isles. Since 1908, 
Over 10,000 children have been treated. Over 9,000 have been discharged with their disease completely arrested. In one recent year, every patient suffering from tuberculosis of the knee was cured. Of all the children treated today, over 90% are assured of a cure. The crippled child need no longer be a lonely outcast. The cripple can be cured. That is the spirit of Trelaws, left behind by a man who loved children.